Once again, thank you, Graham. Look forward to your message. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, it's been a God-ordained moment to have Graham and Michelle here on the campground to minister to us. Thank you for um, protecting them and bringing them here. And thank you for the message that, that you have given them to preach. I pray for Mission Serenity. I pray for Graham. I pray for Michelle. I pray for all that they are doing and all that they will do with your spirit working through them. Thank you for us and for that we can come here with our brokenness and that we can listen and we can begin the process in our hearts of reconciliation too. Just we pray in thy name. Amen. Amen. Just one more thing. If if you're um, feeling emotion stirring and you think you need to talk about that, then please don't bottle it up. Men are good at bottling things up and, and not talking about it. Um, I'm setting up throughout the conference a referral service um, of counsellors that we recommend that you can talk to and we'd like to help you. So please contact me at the office if you feel you want to talk to someone further. If issues are being stirred up um, through the presentations, we don't want to leave you dangling. Talk to Graham, talk to Michelle while they're here, here today and tomorrow. Otherwise, talk to me and I'll see what I can do to find somewhere close by to refer you to. Don't just let it dangle. Thank you. That's too good an offer to refuse. Thanks, Darren. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Just forgive me while I have a quick prayer. I just feel impressed to have a quick prayer for myself. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I praise and honour you. You are beautiful. Everything you've created is beautiful. And I pray, Lord, that the words that come from my mouth today will be beautiful. Not because they're picturesque or any, for any other reason or to glorify me, Father, but to shed light on your kingdom, which is beautiful. And to take us from the bondage and the darkness of Satan's imposed empire here on this planet. Lord, you gave us kingdom authority when you died on the cross so that we may tell Satan to leave. And it is with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that we demand that Satan and his angels now leave this place and that your Holy Spirit will fill us, Lord, is our prayer in your name. Amen. Today we're talking about reconciliation. And reconciliation is a vital part of where we go in our journey, not only to become good men, but to become good citizens. Everything that Jesus has given us means nothing unless we follow his lead. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God the Father, was sent to this planet to reconcile us with our Father in heaven. And if it was so important that that reconciliation meant the cruel death of Jesus on the cross, then if we don't consider reconciliation in our lives, we are missing a golden opportunity. We may be missing salvation. More about that in a moment. I want to recap on yesterday. Are we seeing slides up there now? Can you see slides on the screen? Okay, I haven't got anything on the monitor. Thank you. We've got, um, yesterday we talked about authentic manhood. The Bible, I believe, is about identity and relationships. If you were to put the whole thing into a blender and then mix it with water and throw it out on this floor here now, I'm sure you would see love on the floor, which is about identity and relationships. How does identity feature in love? Let me explain it, how it works in my marriage with Michelle. I believe that Michelle is perfect just the way she is, the way that God created her. Matthew 5 tells us, blessed are the meek. Meek are people who are non-controlling. In other words, a meek person is someone who accepts that you are made from God in God's likeness and you should be allowed to flourish the way he designed you. For me to impose my will and my direction in Michelle's life is idolatry. That's me creating God in my image, not his, through her. So the way I view our marriage is, and she is the same with me, God has given me the job of being the ranger in her national park. The ranger in her national park. My job is to patrol her boundaries, 
Firstly, I have to know where those boundaries are and she's very good at defining her boundaries. I patrol her boundaries and I make sure that she's safe. I make sure that no one takes a pot shot at her, tries to capture her, hinder her or hunt her down. And the benefit for me is if she is a wedge tail eagle in the Royal National Park of God the Creator, then I get the pleasure as the ranger to watch her fly the way he designed every single day of my life. And that is a pleasure. That helps me see God as the Creator beautiful because I get to see her in all her glory, unhindered, free as a bird. And the benefits for me, apart from getting to witness, is that, witness that, is that she allows me to live under her protection because she is the ranger of my national park. And in my mind's eye, I just see us as two eagles soaring around this beautiful national park together, side by side. Now, I want to recap a little bit on what happened yesterday. Because what happens a lot, when I present this ministry, a lot of people say to me, a lot of men in particular, you're really hammering us. It's all about all the bad things that we do. What about all the things that women do to cause breakups in marriages and abuse and everything else as well? I want to recap a little on my testimony. I was a victim of physical, mental and emotional abuse in my marriage at the hands of my first wife. I want to also say this, when we are accountable and responsible, it means that we, or me as an individual, I accept responsibility for my behaviour. I don't justify by saying, I wouldn't have behaved like that, I wouldn't have watched pornography if you gave me more sex. That's not what it's about. That's her journey. My journey is, I watch pornography and therefore I sin, and I'm the one who chooses to sin or not to sin. I'm the one. So when I'm talking to men about these issues, I'm not saying that men are the ones to blame for everything. This is a men's ministry tent. I'm here to talk to you about the stuff that we as men need to be responsible for, and I pray that the women's ministry tent is doing a little bit more or women's ministry in general, than running princess parties and pampering parties. Because women now need to be talking about the real issues. Not, yet, not tomorrow, not the next day, but now. It's half past issue o'clock. Women need to learn how to be good wives to their husbands. Now there are some skills of thought that being a good wife to your husband means zipping up your lip, saying nothing and being subservient. Well, all right, that might have worked in, a, in the perfect world as it may have been described in several chapters in the Bible. But women can't fulfil that role if men are absent. Women can't fulfil that role if their husbands are abusive. Women can't fulfil that role if they don't have a husband. Everyone criticised the women's movement because they say the women's movement has taken the whole thing out of kilter. But there wouldn't have been a need for a women's movement if men stood strong. They had to form a movement in order to regroup to keep everything together. And we have to accept responsibility for our role in that and women need to accept the responsibility for the fact that a lot of men are broken because of their behaviours. And that needs to be dealt with in women's ministry. So I'm happy to cop criticism for saying, oh, it's all about men and all the things that men do. That's fine. I'm happy to cop that. But I'm not a women's ministry person and I'm not a woman. Girls, you need to get your act together in your own tent. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. I want to tell you how that whole concept works. I recently, in the last few years, after I met Michelle, before, or let me say before I met Michelle, I had a story that was based on a lie. I had a story that happened kind of by accident. And I'll tell you how it happened. I had a fractured relationship with my father for a time because my brother, who, who was 12 years older than me, left home when I was five and I missed him. And it took me 40 odd years to rebuild and try and connect some kind of relationship with my brother. He disappeared. 
And it was really hard because he was so wounded from events that happened in the family that anyone who, who had the same last name as him was, was kept at a distance because he didn't trust anyone with the last name of Hood. I now know that that was based on a false premise, as I've since discovered a bit more about that later on. But what I noticed was that there was a real barrier between my father and me and my brother. And I wanted us to draw together as a family. I wanted us to become closer. I wanted my brother and I to share a relationship with my father because I had that sense of responsibility. And when I told my father that I'd found my brother and established a relationship with him, he said to me, oh, you better give me Robert's phone number so I can give him a call. But my brother had told me, I'll talk to you, but don't ever put me in touch with my mother or father. Now, sadly, I, I found my brother just before my mother died. And when my mother died, I, I contacted him and I said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but mum's just died. He said, I don't care. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. He said, don't ever tell me my father's dead either. Dad died two years ago. My, I haven't officially told my brother that he died. He told me not to. That's another story. But in the process of trying to get my father and brother together, my dad asked me, could he call my brother and could I give him the phone number? And I said, no, I can't do that unless I get his permission. So I rang my brother a few days later and I said, Dad wants to talk to you. Do I have permission to give him your phone number? He said, definitely not. Okay. So the, the following day, my daughter and I went to visit my father and stepmother and we sat down in the lounge room and my father said, have you spoken to Robert? Can I call him? And I said, I have. And he said, he doesn't want you to call him and he's not given me permission to give you his number. And my dad said, oh, well, what have I ever done to him? Now, at that stage, I was pretty raw with my father because my, I was coming to terms with things my father did that weren't, oh, weren't very successful in the parenting stakes. And I said to dad, straight out of the blue, in anger, and as the words are coming out of my mouth, I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, probably because the same reason I struggle with you, like your friend molested me when I was a kid. And what do you care about that? And while you're at it, he stole all the money that you hid in the jam jars under the house that you accused mum of stealing. And I'm thinking as it's coming out, what am I saying? Because it wasn't true. It wasn't true. It just blurted out because I wanted to hit him with something and the first thing I could think of was that. And then I'd back myself into a corner momentarily. But then he made it worse because his response to that was, he stole the money. You see what I mean? It was more important about the money than what I told him. It just happened to me. So I got angrier and it escalated. And my daughter, my teenage daughter, is sitting in the lounge room and she's hearing this and she's going, what? And I'm looking at it and it's like it went out of control. And I drove home with my daughter and she's sitting in the car with me and she said, Dad, I can't believe that happened to you as a kid. And I, I thought, how do I deal with this? How do I get out of this? And I said, oh, well, you know, life's been tough. And then later on, she talked about it a few days later and she said, Dad, that explains why you behaved, you know, you've had all these problems with mum and everything. And I thought, oh. And I said, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, you've got no idea what it's like to be abused as a child. It affects you. And then after a while, that became my truth. When I was explaining my life story to other people who were saying, you know, how come you do this and how come you do that? Oh, I was abused as a kid, da-da-da, that was my story. See the irony in this because I'm...